Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining our webinar on Redistricting 101. I'm Melissa Keene. I'm a senior program manager with the Institute for Local Government, and I will be your host and moderator this morning. Local governments across the state are beginning the redistricting process. Because this process only happens once every decade, the stakes are high, especially for those doing it for the first time. This webinar will share the basics of the process, legal requirements, and tips to navigate the process gracefully. Uh, you will gain a better understanding of the roles of staff and elected officials and how to manage the timeline to create a successful redistricting process and plan. Here's today's agenda. Um, so right now we're doing a quick welcome and we'll cover some logistics um, and then we'll introduce our presenters this morning and then we'll go through the real meat of the, of the webinar here. We're going to talk about what is redistricting, a snapshot of the process, talk through the rules of the road, map requirements, operational practices and community engagement, uh, and then the timeline and census data, which I'm sure there's a lot of questions about. Um, and then we will hold time for the, at the end for Q&A, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. And then we will also share our contact information with you all um, for any follow-up as needed. So you've probably noticed that your line has been <coughs> muted. Um, you will remain muted for the duration of the call. But that doesn't mean you can't ask us questions. Uh, so you should see a questions box in your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, you can drop questions into that at any point in time during the webinar. Um, we will be uh, monitoring those on the back end and responding as we can. And then, um, as I just noted, we will also um, get to as many questions as we can during the Q&A towards the end of this webinar. So a little bit about ILG before we get started. Um, we are a nonprofit training and education affiliate of the League of California Cities, the California State Association of Counties, and the California Special Districts Association. So we provide practical and easy to use resources so that local agencies can effectively implement policies on the ground. Uh, we do that in a variety of ways. We do a lot of education and training, such as this webinar that you're on this morning, and we do other conference sessions and um, specialized trainings for local governments. Um, in addition, we do technical assistance, capacity building, convening services for our uh, local government partners statewide in four main program areas. Uh, so we focus on leadership and governance, which covers things like your state mandated training, um, uh, uh, people who are new to public service. We have a whole suite of materials for, uh, for those folks as they kind of get onboarded and figure out the, the rules of the road. Uh, and then we also have some materials and training focused on uh, good governance and how to be an effective team. We also focus on civics education and workforce, uh, which really helps facilitate municipal school partnerships and create that pipeline to public service um, and get young folks interested in local government as a possible career path. We also focus on public engagement, which covers a whole host of things, um, everything from getting started to dealing with difficult meeting participants to um, engaging your community around some of the uh, more challenging topics that you're probably dealing with around housing, around climate, um, just a lot of different topics there and really how to embed public engagement into your operations. And then lastly, we also focus on sustainable communities. Um, right now, that program is focusing a lot on um, housing efforts um, and then also around um, climate and connecting folks to cap and trade funding and um, providing technical assistance in that space and doing things of that nature. Uh, but we also run another award program um, that recognizes uh, efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, save energy, and implement sustainability best practices. So if you're not super familiar with us, definitely encourage you to go to our website and check out um, all of our free resources. Our presenters this morning are Mal Richardson, who's a partner with Best Dustin Krieger, um, Stephanie Smith, who's the Director of Election Services with BBK, um, and also a former city clerk, and then Ken Strasma, the CEO of Haystack DNA. Um, and I just want to give a big thank you to our partner, Best Dustin Krieger, for making today's webinar possible. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter team to get us started. Thanks, Melissa. I really appreciate that. Um, so my name is, uh, I'm Stephanie Smith. I'm the Director of Election Services for Best Best in Krieger. And uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm getting a lot of feedback all of a sudden. Just want to make sure. Yes, we, we can, can hear you, hear Stephanie. You, I think um, okay. I think maybe everybody else needs to mute their lines if they haven't done so. Yeah, all Hopefully of a sudden, just tons feedback. of feedback. Okay. Um, so um, I uh, recently joined Best Best in Krieger. Um, a lot of you may know me. I spent the last 30 years in municipal government as a municipal clerk. And so uh, retired from the public sector side and decided to um, help out, uh, continue to help clerks with election related issues and helping our um, partner agencies um, navigate this redistricting process. So 
why is redistricting important? I wanted to highlight this particular map. It was created in 1689. Now, some of you may realize that the Mayflower landed in 1620. So almost 70 years after the Mayflower, when um, a lot of us might think of this territory as the precursor to America, um, was actually uh, claimed by France. Uh, the everything west of the Rockies was called New Mexico and everything east of the Rockies in this map is labeled Canada or New France. So what does this mean? Well, basically is that things change over time and that the maps that we drew 10 years ago, or maybe if you were recently transmit, transitioned to districts five years ago, four years ago, um, they're not valid anymore. And also the people drawing the maps have a lot to say about what how the maps are perceived, right? So getting the map drawing process correct is really important. The French drew this map when um, the colonists had already populated the entire um, Eastern seaboard. And yet the French drew this as claiming the territory. So the people drawing the maps have a lot of power to kind of set the perspective. Uh, next slide. So why is redistricting important? Um, this little spreadsheet um, relates to the city of Big Bear Lake, which is one of the smaller jurisdictions here in California. And whereas you can look at um, the, their population over the last 10 years, there's been a very small population deviation um, since the last uh, census, about one and a half percent. Um, what we did was overlaid, because we don't have a census data yet, and Mal's going to talk about that, um, but what we did was overlay the American Community Survey, which is another really great data source um, on top of their district boundaries, and realized that two of their four census tracts in the town had seen um, about 250% shift in demographics. So even though they're a small city, very small population change, um, they may need to draw their boundaries again because of that massive shift in the ethnic breakdown. Next slide. Mapping is more than just mapping people. If you look at uh, this particular map, this is by county and it shows, this is a partisan map, it shows the breakdown of California um, in terms of party. And uh, we'd like to think of California as this big blue state. But if you break it down by county, it's actually about 50%. Uh, it's about 50% Republican, 50% uh, Demo uh, Democrat. So not quite the big blue state that we think. So this is broken out by county. Next slide. However, if you take the population of California and you apply it across the state, you get this big blue ocean. So the population centers in Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, those are concentrated in specific counties. Those counties might, those counties are overwhelmingly democratic. But if you take their population and disperse it across the state, then the entire state becomes democratic. So what does this mean? It means that districts matter. Districts matter. Uh, it allows people uh, that may not be part of the majority majority to elect the representative of their choice. By breaking the state up into counties or into districts that are, um, you know, that have different interests, it allows people to elect candidates of their choice. And so the same thing applies in our local agencies. If you have an entire city that is, um, you have a majority population, the majority would always win. Um, but by breaking them into districts, you allow people that might be part of a minority majority to elect the candidate of their choice, which is the, um, the ultimate goal of the Voting Rights Act. Next slide. So what is redistricting? It's basically drawing your electoral boundaries to allow the community to elect candidates of their choice. If you look at this, um, this little people community um, and look at that center district, um, it's about 75% um, minority population. By creating a district that is a minority majority uh, or majority minority, um, it allows um, it allows that um, minority minority population to elect a candidate of their choice. You could slice up this district, uh, this community, in a way that would dilute um, that would dilute. The minority population, and in doing so, you might be depriving that population 
of the right to elect a candidate of their choice. So that's what redistricting really is. That's what district ele elections really are, is creating boundaries that allow the community to elect their own representatives. Next slide. So really quickly, um, the snapshot of the process, um, I'm gonna go through this pretty quick, um, but the general provisions um, for uh, that apply to everyone are in the elections code um, 21,000, general law cities, charter cities, special districts, and you can uh, you know look at whatever applies to your particular agency. Next slide. So our rules of the road. Um, the cities, they're different, first of all, um, between cities and special districts. And I know we have representatives from both on this webinar. Uh, cities, you must hold at least four public hearings. One public hearing must be conducted before the council draws a map. Before they can consider any map, they have to have at least one hearing to take public input. And at least two of those hearings have to be after the council draws a map. Next slide. So, one of your hearings um, has to be, um, or it can be a community workshop, um, has to be held on a Saturday or a Sunday or on a weekday that's after um, six o'clock. And the reason for that is the, the legislature recognizes that some, um, some cities meet during the day and they meet during the week during the day. And that's not really gonna get the most public engagement. So for this process, you must hold at least one of your hearings or a workshop on a weekend or in the evening after six o'clock. Um, all of your locations have to be accessible for people with disabilities. And this is the really um, interesting one is they must be time specific. And what that means is if you advertise your, a lot of clerks will advertise all of their public hearings for the same start time as their city council meeting. Well, with redistricting, you have to hold your hearing at the time you advertised it. And that means if you've got other business, you have to set all of that aside and start your hearing at the time you picked. So if your council meetings regularly start at six, you might wanna advertise your public hearing for seven o'clock. That way you can get through your consent calendar, presentations, anything else you have. And if you are in the middle of an item when seven o'clock comes along, you can finish that agenda item. But if there's anything between that item and your hearing, you have to skip those and go straight to your hearing. You must start it as close to the time of the advertised public hearing as possible. And then you can come back and finish any business that you had to skip over. Likewise, if you advertise it for um, say a half hour or an hour after your normal meeting time, if you get through your regular agenda before that time, you need to recess until the time of that meeting, time of that advertised hearing. You cannot start it early. You must recess until say the seven o'clock time that you put on your notice. So you're gonna really wanna focus on um, your agendas, figure out what times are gonna work best for you. And then that's the time you're gonna put in your public hearing notice. Next slide. So special districts, they kind of have a little bit of, of the easy track here. They only have to hold two public hearings. And one hearing um, has to be before the vote to adopt the proposed boundaries. And one hearing um, will be the meeting where they do um, adopt the proposed boundaries. So at that first hearing, you could present draft maps. You could have maps ready to go at that first public hearing and get some feedback from the trustee board. Um, and then you can narrow it down to one map and then you post that and you advertise that for your next hearing and then they can adopt it at the second public hearing. So a much easier process. Next slide. Let's see. Okay. So all of the agencies, all of the agencies have the option of forming some advisory commission, of forming a commission, and there are three types. An advisory commission um, holds meetings and workshops, takes that public input, provides that to the legislative body, but then the legislative body still holds the official public hearings. It's really just a way to get more people in the community involved and to perhaps get some additional perspective on your boundaries. Um, now, an independent commission is where the council will appoint this independent commission and delegate the entire process to that commission. The council will no longer be responsible for drawing the district boundaries. They can participate as a member of the public, but they have no um, extra weight or voice in approving the maps. The commission approves the maps. They hold all the hearings, they hold the workshops, and they approve the final maps. Now, there is a hybrid commission, which um, is a little bit of both, 
where they will appoint a commission to conduct some public hearings, make recommendations on one to two maps, and then the council must adopt one of the maps that is recommended by the hybrid commission. They don't have the authority to draw their own map at that point. They can send it back to the hybrid commission, but they cannot adopt a map on their own that doesn't didn't come as a recommendation from the commission. Um, I want to point out that any community that's looking at a commission option um, really needs to start taking action now because it takes about two to three months to form a commission, recruit for a commission, and then train those commissioners on their roles. So um, I'm not going to say you've missed the boat, but it is going to be very challenging if you have not started yet and you want to form some kind of a commission. Um, next slide. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Mal. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So Stephanie walked us through um, the procedural requirements for redistricting. I'm going to give you um, a snapshot, and it's a very, very quick snapshot, and really at 30,000 feet of the substantive requirements for the maps that you draw as part of this, this, this redistricting process. Um, quick background, I'm Mal Richardson, partner at BBK. I'm co-chair of the firm's election practice. Um, and if you want more details, you can give me a call and we can chat, but I think that suffices for now. Um, okay, so map requirements. Um, there are criteria for cities, there are criteria for districts, there are criteria that apply to both. Um, the, the standard criteria arise from federal law, right? A council or a board must adopt uh, district boundaries that comply with the Constitution of the United States, uh, the California Constitution, and the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, the, the primary criterion that we're looking at um, actually arises from the FVRA, which, which, which essentially states that no voting qualification or prerequisite to voting or standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied by any state or political subdivision in a manner which results in denial or abridgment of the right of any citizen of the U.S. to vote on account of race or color um, or in contravention of other guarantees set forth in federal law. Basically, we have to give equal access um, to voting to minority communities. And that's that's really what we're most concerned about um, when it comes to federal law. Okay, next slide. Um, there, there are um, a number of criteria that you have to satisfy as, as you're drawing these maps beyond though, um, uh, equities that, that, that pertain to race um, uh, and to ethnicity. So districts must be drawn so they are substantially equal in population as required by the U.S. Constitution. Now, this is based on total population of residents of the city based on the census, um, does not include incarcerated persons unless the last known place of residence of that person is within your city. So if you have a city that is home to a jail or a prison, your population count does not include that jail or prison. It just includes those, those, those persons in that jail or prison who originated from your city. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so the Fair Maps Act um, and, uh, and its subsequent cleanup bill um, provide for uh, five criteria, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through them in their, or, in their order of priority. First, um, districts must be geographically contiguous, um, uh, which basically means that areas that meet only at the points of adjoining corners, right, those aren't contiguous. Areas that are separated by water, that aren't connected by a bridge, a tunnel, or, or a ferry service, are not contiguous. So you have to have contiguity, geographical contiguity with your districts. Um, the geographical integrity of local neighborhoods or communities of interest must be respected. Now these communities of interest, that's a defined term. It's a population that shares common social or economic interests that should be included within a single district for purposes of effective and fair representation. Uh, these, these communities do not include relationships with political parties, with incumbents, with candidates. These are like larger HOAs, right? The downtown area. Most cities have, 
you know, different areas that are known uh, to the residents. And so those 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 areas, again, a large HOA, for example, or a downtown area have to be respected and cannot be divided. Um, the the districts have to be easily identifiable and understandable by the residents uh, to the extent practicable districts uh, should be bounded by natural and artificial barriers streets major arterials of course the boundaries of the cities uh, you know this this of course has to make sense to the residents who are looking at the districts okay next slide uh, next slide please Okay. Um, okay. They 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 have to be. Um, uh, hang on one second. I think we skipped a slide. Let's let's go back a slide here. Okay. We. Oh, I'm sorry. It was it was compacted into one slide. So the last, the fourth and the fifth criteria. Um, are ge uh, fourth is geographical compactness. Um, which is which is somewhat similar to contiguity, right? You have geographical contiguity often when you have compactness, and then finally, uh, you cannot draw your districts in in a way uh, that that favors or discriminates against a political party, right? We have to be blind to politics as we draw our district boundaries. Okay, next slide. Now we move on to special districts. Okay. So we have only three considerations with special districts. It's much simpler. Uh, first, they have to be equal in population. Um, uh, second, uh, they have to give consideration to and comply with uh, both constitutions and the Federal Voting Rights Act. And we talked about that in my first slide, right? Um, respecting the voting rights of, of, uh, of ethnic minority groups and uh, um, and so forth. The third criteria uh, is kind of an amalgamation of the third, fourth, and fifth criteria for cities, but here it is subjective, right? So a special district may give consideration. They aren't required to, but they may give consideration to uh, topography, geography, cohesiveness, contiguity, compactness, communities of interest, again, that's not a requirement, but they may give consideration to that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so these are requirements that are applicable to all agencies, not just cities, not just districts, but everybody. Uh, the first is uh, districts have to be substantially equal in population as required by the U.S. Constitution. This is the principle of one person, one vote. Uh, now, we don't have to have exact equality. Under federal law, um, we only have to have substantial equality, which allows for some derivation from absolute equality. Um, a, a general rule of thumb is that 10% population differences are okay, um, but there are different rules. Um, in different jurisdictions. There are some cities that have much lower requirements and some that allow for that 10% threshold or even higher. Um, and then finally, compliance with the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965, as, as, as was shared in previous slides, is required of both special districts and cities. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so what does it mean to comply with the Voting Rights Act? Um, or how do we comply with the Voting Rights, Rights Act, I should say? Um, you should consider adding verbiage to your redistricting ordinance to ensure protection of Minority Voting Rights Act. Now, it's, it's never a slam dunk that you're not going to get sued. And if you take an action um, that, that does in some way disenfranchise some minority voting bloc, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to defend that. But if you've if you've put language in your redistricting ordinance that that seeks to protect minority voting rights at or voting rights, it puts you in a much better position in the event that you do get sued. Um, Section two of the Voting Rights Act um, needs to be understood. Right. So this 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 states very, very basically that no local agency's redistricting map can deny or abridge the right to vote on account of race, color, or membership in a language minority group, right? This gets back to the language that needs to be embedded in your ordinance that protects these minority groups or seeks to protect them. But you have to understand 
um, the basics of the Voting Rights Act so as not to uh, contravene its requirements. And finally, you want to avoid cracking and packing minority votes. Cracking is um, it's drawing lines to dilute the minority vote in nearby districts, and packing draws lines to force minority votes into one district, so the potential for multiple minority district is reduced or eliminated, right? So both of those are not allowed. The next few slides, I'll just illustrate some examples of cracking and packing, okay? So next slide. Okay, this is obviously not California. If you took what fifth grade geography, you will recognize that this is Louisiana. Um, this is obviously a gerrymandered district or districts. You've got one that's red, one that's blue, um, and uh, you know these are these 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 would not be allowed um, in California. I I won't go into the details, but this is an example of packing. Um, and generally, if you're going to see a district like this, right, you're you're having a tough time with contiguity, with compactness. But as Ken will show, this isn't always impermissible as long as we've complied with the criteria that were previously um, sh shown uh, on on the previous slides. Okay, next slide. Okay, here we have Texas. This is Austin, Texas. This is the capital of Texas. Uh, it was once all in one congressional district that would have been a deeply blue district instead austin is chopped up and dispersed among six different district uh, districts the result is a diced up and cracked capital with a really big delegation um, five of the districts are republican one is democrat you can see this is this is extreme gerrymandering um, but this is an example of cracking we'll go to the next slide and here we have here we have Maryland, perhaps the most gerrymandered district um, in the nation. Um, it, it's an example of packing. This this district was drawn exclusively to favor Democrats. You can see how broken up it is all throughout counties. Um, a federal judge characterized this as quote a broken winged pterodactyl lying prostrate across the strait, and also likened it to a blood spatter. At a crime scene. You can obviously tell that with this kind of sprawl, it can be very difficult to respect communities of interest. It's obviously not compact. It's obviously not contiguous. This is the kind of thing that we need to avoid in California as part of the redistricting pro uh, process. Okay, next slide, and I think this is uh, on to Ken. And I do think you're muted. Let's see if we can do this one. Okay. I, I, th I think that works. I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> unmuted by the organizer. So thank you. Uh, so so it, as, as Mel alluded to, not every um, every district uh, uh, that looks weird is a gerrymander. Um, could we go? I, I'm not sure how the animation is working. Could we go back to uh, two clicks on this slide? If there's a version where we're just seeing the, the pink outline by itself. Oh, I apologize. I, they, this is a PDF. It's not the oh, so the animations okay. don't show up. I didn't realize there was animations. I apologize. Oh, okay. Ne ne never mind. So, so uh, I imagine that all you could see uh, was was the pink district here. Uh, so, so, so I love the the description of the Maryland district as the broken wing pterodactyl. Um, this district could be uh, very well described uh, um, as a dragon. It's got you know it's got its mouth. Uh, it's got wings. Um, it's even got the eye um, in, in the, the, the northeastern co corner. Um, and so it's a sort of, and, you know, who knows, like octopus legs or, or what, whatever down, down at the bottom. Um, it, it looks terrible. Um, but when you start uh, to uh, in, investigate why the district ended up looking like it did, it makes a lot more sense. 
Uh, so the first thing uh, we, we added in the water layers, this is in Madison, Wisconsin, which uh, is, uh, it's downtown is on an isthmus between two lakes. Uh, so those lakes uh, force the skinny body in the middle. Um, the dark lines on the bottom are minor civil division lines. So towns and villages south of Madison uh, that were kept together um, in, in re respect uh, uh, for, uh, for redistricting criteria, uh, what, one of which was uh, to try to preserve minor civil divisions. Um, and then even uh, the, those, uh, those white dots that, that look uh, non-contiguous and uh, on, uh, on the surface would be, uh, we could be considered impermissible. Those are actually town islands. Uh, so by the wing, that little triangle is the town of Madison. Um, I believe the Dragon's Eye is the town of Burke. Um, the city of Madison started out, um, you know, 100 years ago was much smaller and it grew over time and annexed uh, land. Um, and it annexed land that uh, in a lot of areas that used to be other towns, but there were some islands that weren't annexed for, for whatever reason. So here, um, the, the map drawers had to balance um, uh, different criteria um, and decide, did they want to enforce uh, strict contiguity or did they want to uh, uh, respect not breaking up these towns? And, and so that's the, the reason for, uh, for those town islands. Um, so when, when you sit down um, and, and go through that, uh, the, the district makes a lot more sense. Um, and this is an exercise I've, I've very often done in, in public hearings with commissions or uh, just sitting down with reporters, being able to talk through a district. It's very easy to make pretty much any district look bad, um, but if you're able to explain the rationale, then the district looks a lot better. Um, and I think that's what's distinct from this versus, say, the, the previous map of Maryland, um, is the question of intent. Um, in the Maryland map, it is very clearly drawn that way to ensure a partisan outcome. Um, and so I think if, if you're able to justify a map as, as meeting other redistricting criteria, uh, then, then it's permissible. Um, anyone is likely to say, oh, I, you know, this isn't a gerrymander, I drew it for some other, you know, good government reason. Um, and that's when you end up getting back and forth with uh, perhaps a good government group will come in and say, okay, well, you know, you wanted to achieve uh, these goals, but here's a map that's much more compact that does those same things. Um, and then that's a way of pushing back if someone claims it was, was some reason um, other than political outcome that led to those maps. Okay, um, moving along the next slide, please. Okay, let's talk a, a, a bit about uh, the, the census data. Um, so as, uh, as, as we're all aware, um, because of, of COVID and, and other factors, uh, the census is uh, delayed uh, significantly compared to uh, in, in previous decades. Uh, the current target release date um, is September 30th, uh, which I, I know causes a lot of uh, troubles in, in various different jurisdictions all across the country that had uh, um, deadlines built, built into uh, their rules based on the, the expectation that uh, the, the census data would have already been released this spring. Um, there is uh, th there are various uh, ways to get a head start on this. Um, we've produced uh, population estimates down to the block level, taking the ACS or American Community Survey, which is the most recent census population estimates. Um, those unfortunately aren't at the block level, so they're not directly usable for drawing districts. Um, but we did disaggregate them to the census block level, so, so we have a set of data that can be used to draw the, the basic outlines of a district ahead of time. Uh, the population deviation would still need to be zeroed out once the actual uh, data comes out. Um, and then one uh, further nuance there, the census is talking about trying to release uh, what they call the legacy format data uh, sometime in late August, although that's a, a, a moving, uh, moving target. Um, that's data that's not in the nice uh, cleaned up format that will be easily loaded into mapping programs. Um, but, you know, we together with various other partners are going to be processing that. So probably a couple weeks after that August release, uh, we, we would have that legacy data in a usable format. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, let's talk a, a little bit about census geography. Um, 
people very often will, will use the term census tract uh, to mean just a unit of, of census geography. It's a term people are most familiar with. A tract is actually uh, the, the third largest uh, or the third smallest um, uh, traditionally used building block. The smallest is the census block, uh, which in an urban area is almost always the same as a city block, uh, so something just about bounded on, on four sides by streets. Um, in rural areas, it can be you know, a much larger uh, area uh, bounded by what, what the census calls any photo identifiable feature. So it could be a stream, it could be a power line, it could be the, the ridge line on, on a mountain range, uh, basically anything that a satellite or aerial picture can identify uh, can be used to bound um, that polygon and whatever the smallest version is uh, will be a block. So you can't ever have a block that has a, a street uh, bisecting it uh, because then the census would turn it into two separate, separate blocks. Uh, blocks are aggregated up into block groups. Uh, block groups, um, you know, several block groups go together to form a tract. Tracts nest inside a county and counties, of course, nest inside a state. Uh, so block, block group, tract, county, and state all nest perfectly. So that those lines don't split each other. Um, and you can build any one of, of those other uh, levels of census geography based on the block. Um, the outlier here is the voting tabulation district, the second one we listed here, often referred to uh, in the census as VTD. So that's whatever lines an election is run on. So very often synonymous with precinct or ward. Uh, but um, in many jurisdictions, and this is often the case in California, um, uh, um, election officials will have multiple precincts voting in the same area, and those the votes are counted and reported um, uh, all, all as one. So if precincts four, five, and six of a jurisdiction all vote together, uh, they are considered one voting tabulation district. Um, in some states, uh, th this, uh, this leads to uh, like a whole lot of work that has to be done in order to, uh, to actually match election results back to political geography. Um, fortunately, California has the, the statewide database, which has been doing this for years, um, and it, it is very good at understanding this process and translating it in election results into uh, a format that matches census geography. Now, um, you, you may be wondering, like, why are we worrying about this so, so much if we're not supposed to be looking at political impact? Uh, but that comes into the voting rights analysis, where we need to be able to look at, does a minority community have the ability to elect their candidate of choice? Uh, so for that, it's actually very important to have um, accurately matched election results. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, what uh, types of, of data do, does the census provide? So, the, the mo most important piece uh, in terms of get, getting uh, uh, low population deviation in districts is just the total population. But within that, the census um, uh, provides the option for people to select one of six different racial categories, uh, white, African-American, Native American, Asian or Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, um, and other. Um, in addition uh, to that, people can choose more than one. Uh, people can check multiple categories. So the census reports um, all of these categories um, alone by themselves or combinations of two through six of those. Uh, so this is part of why what, if you see raw census data, you see columns and columns um, of, of that information, the combination. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so I, I, I jumped ahead of myself. This is just talking about how uh, we, we can uh, list mu multiple combinations. Um, one thing that makes um, MapDraw's jobs a little easier is that the large majority of population select only one race. So that whatever one race alone is, is the biggest building block. And also for most voting rights um, analysis, people will look at non-Hispanic white alone um, versus everything else. Um, and if the everything else, you know, including combinations of the six different races, et cetera, um, becomes enough to potentially elect uh, minority communities candidate of choice, then we dig into the, the detail of, of those different combinations of races. Next slide. Uh, 
so you, you may have noticed that Hispanic was not one of the races listed. Um, that's because uh, in census terminology, Hispanic is considered an origin rather than a race. Um, and each one of the racial categories listed may or may not be Hispanic. So it's two, if, if you remember your census form, um, yeah, th it's two separate questions. Uh, what race and yes or no, are you of Hispanic origin? And so for each of the racial categories, um, there are then that they list the total, and then there's two separate ones, Hispanic and non-Hispanic, for each one of those six racial categories and the combinations of multiple racial categories. Next slide, please. Um, there, there is, the, the, um, and then, then they have yet another cut at this, which is the voting age population. So the people by each one of these race and origin categories that are 18 plus. Now, the, the voting age populace, population is not used for district uh, uh, population equality. Um, its total population is, is what needs to be equal for, for districts. Um, the voting age population comes more into play when we're, we're looking at uh, a Voting uh, Rights Act uh, district analysis. Next. Um, and then an, another uh, special tabulation uh, that the census uh, re releases, it's not part, part of the main census redistricting release, but the census does it separately, um, is citizen voting age population. Um, so again, this is not used for population equality. Uh, so it's all people, regardless of age, regardless of citizenship status, are counted towards district total population. Um, but because only citizens can vote and only people 18 plus can vote, um, it does come into play when we get to the point of doing Voting Rights Act um, analysis and, and uh, racial block voting analysis. Next slide. Uh, next. So I, I've mentioned a, a few times uh, the concept of, of racial block voting analysis. So this is the process where we, we look at how different racial groups vote in order to help answer the question, can a minority uh, group elect their candidate of choice? Um, the uh, that, uh, that phrase is used because it's not always necessary for the candidate elected to be the same race or origin as the voters in the district. If the voters in a district prefer a candidate who is of a different race, um, they are still exercising their ability to elect their candidate of choice. So if it can be demonstrated, you know, for example, that a Hispanic district was voting for a non-Hispanic candidate and succeeded in electing them, um, that would that then be permissible. So part of this analysis has to be uh, determining who the candidate of, of choice is. Now, because of the secret ballot, we of course don't know how individuals are voting. All we know is um, how a, a VTD, voting tabulation district, voted um, in aggregate. And we also know the population of that VTD. So by itself, there's no way of knowing for one VTD with the population and the votes, um, how uh, different racial and origin groups voted. However, when you uh, take a bunch of VTDs in a district, you can begin to create uh, boundaries of the possible outcomes. You're able to say, okay, if uh, we're, you know, for example, the African American voters voted, you know, they could have voted anywhere between 10 and 90% for a particular candidate in one VTD. But then when you add another VTD and another VTD, the possible range um, that uh, can explain the outcome across all of the precincts uh, or VTDs in a district gets narrower. And the, the technique used for, for this uh, is uh, called ecological inference regression. Um, and that's uh, what's been accepted by the courts for making an estimate of the, the most likely uh, vote by, by different minority groups. Um, and the range of, of, of possible uh, of possible uh, votes by those groups. Um, and that definitely comes in handy play when we're talking about uh, the Voting Rights Act uh, analysis. Next slide, please. I touched uh, briefly earlier on, on census geography. Uh, this just illustrates a, a little bit more the uh, 
um, how uh, the different uh, um, units uh, nest. So we see here we, we have the U.S. within it, California. Uh, every person in California, every block in California is in one and only one county. Um, block groups are all in only one county. They don't split counties. Uh, or, I'm sorry, tracts um, don't split counties. Block groups uh, don't split tracts. And blocks, as I mentioned before, are, are the smallest building block. Now, there are a lot of other levels of, of census geography that don't uh, meet this uh, nesting hierarchy. So minor civil divisions uh, don't necessarily uh, reflect tract lines. A tract can uh, straddle a, a minor civil division. Um, and then there's a lot of other things, um, uh, tribal lands um, especially, uh, my cross-county vet boundaries and minor civil division boundaries. Uh, school districts, other political districts uh, can all cross those uh, census boundaries. Next slide, please. And we have a quick clarifying question, if you don't mind revisiting this a little bit. Um, can you clarify the difference between a tract and a block? I'm sure. So a tract is, is a, a group of, of potentially hundreds of blocks. Um, it's, uh, it's something that, that like, you, you'll never run into it in your daily life. I mean, people know what city they live in, they know their zip code, et cetera. A tract is really only used as, as for organizing census data collection, uh, but a tract uh, is made up of multiple block groups, and each block group is made up of multiple blocks. Uh, so think of a tract as a, as a fairly large uh, unit of geography. If you're drawing maps on tracts, you're going to have to eventually switch down probably to the block level in order to zero out the population deviation, um, especially if you're working on a congressional map where um, close to zero is, is the criteria. Um, if you have uh, a broader, broader range of allowable population deviation, you might be able to draw a district entirely on tract. Great, thank you. Okay, and then I, I just wanted to uh, to close by by talking about a, a little bit of the census terminology. I know I've, I've tossed around a, a lot of, of these and, and some sometimes uh, um, it sounds like a bunch of buzz, buzzwords. Uh, so one that you'll hear a, a lot, uh, PL data or PL 94171, uh, that is named after the, the public law that established um, the, the release of census data for redistricting. And basically all, all that is is the term for the official uh, population data that's used in redistricting. So if someone talks about PL data, uh, that's what we're waiting to come out in September, the total population counts. Um, on, on another uh, thing you'll hear, STF3, um, that's a, a legacy name that used to uh, stand for summary tape file back when uh, the census uh, stored everything on big uh, uh, big reel-to-reel -reel computer tapes. Uh, that's the sort of stuff that has things like, you know, how many bathrooms in a building, you know, is it heated by coal or natural gas, et cetera. All those details that are on the census long form or American Community Survey, uh, those are not uh, released on the same time frame as the PL data um, and also don't come in, into play um, for redistricting. Uh, you'll often hear people refer to VAP, that's just short for voting age population that we touched on before, um, and CVAP. Uh, people refer to CVAP, it's citizen voting age population. Uh, VRA, uh, as we talked about before, that's Voting Rights, Rights Act, and people often talk about VRA districts, um, and so that just means a district that potentially has the ability to elect um, a, a minority candidate or the candidate of choice of a, a minority community. Um, and then finally, you'll hear about TIGER. Uh, so while PL is the population data, the, the numeric data on population, TIGER is the lines, um, like what defines what a block is. Um, and it's, it's one of those, those famous uh, backronyms. I believe it's uh, topologically integrated geographic encoding and uh, referencing um, is, uh, is what it stands for. Uh, but basically, it just means the, the lines that make up all those units of geography talking about. So, okay, I believe I'm handing it back to Mel. Actually, we're to Stephanie now. Oh, okay. Thanks, Ken. Um, so I wanted to go over 
briefly, what are your operational requirements? You know, the uh, the Fair Maps Act really put some heavy requirements in terms of outreach uh, with uh, the cities. Um, I'm going to get to special districts in just a second. First of all, um, you're going to want to utilize all of your media outlets to advertise your hearings. You're going to want to include your foreign language newspapers if possible. Um, if you can show that you went this extra effort to um, engage members of minority populations in the map drawing process if and and not and as mal said you know nothing's going to foolproof um uh, a map from any type of a cvra challenge um but if you were to if you were to be challenged on your maps and you can show this history of advertising in your foreign language newspapers um volunteering language translation um at um, for outreach at your public meetings. If you're um, asked to provide a translator, you must provide one. But, you know, consider volunteering that. Consider, um, know what your Voting Rights Act languages are. And if you don't know, you can get that information from your registrar of voters. But it's the languages that you normally publish your notice of election in. So if you just publish it in English and Spanish, um, maybe um, Chinese and Korean, Think about having translators available in those languages um, at your workshops, at your hearings. Uh, produce your materials in multiple languages if you can. Um, don't forget American Sign Language in terms of um, having a translator available at your hearings because people um, will not only appreciate it, but number two, again, it's going to help you in the event there were to be some unlikely challenge to your map. Um, Ideally, the, the point of this is to make the process as transparent as possible. You want to ensure that um, everyone, and I mean everyone in your community, has the ability to participate if they choose in this process. For cities, this means substantial outreach, right? Making sure that you're um, in every community, you're in every community of interest, and that you're reaching as many people as possible in as many languages as possible. Um, you want to invite the public to submit their own maps. Now, I realize that a lot of us, when we went through the transition to district process, um, there was so much contention, right? Because people had been used to being at large for a long time. For some cities, maybe, you know, 50, 60, 100 years. And then now all of a sudden they're div divvying the community up. So there was a lot of community involvement uh, that maybe wasn't easy for the public agency to go through. But the redistricting process, now everyone's had a little bit of experience being in districts. Um, I think a lot of people have realized that um, it's made it easier to, um, to get to their representative. It made it easier to talk to their representative. Um, I know that candidates think that it was easier because they only had to deal with maybe 20 to, um, you know, 15 to 20% of the population um, versus the entire population, right? It's very easy to walk a district in most communities. Um, but invite, don't be afraid, invite the uh, members of the public to submit their own maps. And there are a lot of tools for that. You can do it on paper. You can do it um, using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, there are online mapping tools that a lot of um, the agencies are using. Um, and there's even some free tools that people can find online. So um, invite them to draw their own maps. If they are engaged and they're showing up at your workshops, invite them to that table. Next slide. Uh, you also, uh, this is for special districts, you want to, again, um, utilize your media outlets, um, you want to, you know, have the the, the other languages um, produce it. it's basically the same, not so much as a requirement under special districts, right, because the Fair Maps Act, which set all of those um, obligations for cities, does not apply to special districts. So um, it's just a good idea. Districts can also be um, the subject of a, of a CVRA challenge. A lot of districts received um, letters from attorneys, um, you know, claiming racially polarized voting and made the transition just like the cities did. Um, so consider using these requirements, using these outlets if you have an opportunity to do so. Next slide. Uh, also, uh, for special districts, again, make it as transparent as possible. But I want to I want to say this one thing to them specifically. Avoid having your in-house GIS staff draw your maps. The rules that were in play 10 years ago when special districts went through redistricting in the past, um, they're not, they're, they were different. 
you know, we have the California Voting Rights Act changes now. We, you know, we have the Federal Voting Rights Act that sometimes got shuffled to the side and all they thought they had to do was make it population balanced. A lot of special districts felt that GIS can draw the city, draw the district up. Um, and, and we're running into that a lot with our special district clients that they're, you know, they've used their GIS teams in the past because they thought the only requirement was population balance. Well, yes, that is, a, that is a requirement, but it also has to comply with all the other provisions of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Um, and now we have the California Voting Rights Act and the California Constitution as well. So um, it's really important that you don't, uh, don't have your GIS people do this. Um, and then also invite the public to submit their own maps um, if possible. Next, next slide. Okay, I think this is me. Yep. We're gonna you know. we're gonna sprint to the finish here. We have an hour scheduled, and I've I've got a, I've got two or three minutes left here. So these are these are straightforward slides. First is the time lane. Um, you see the 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 dates here by which you have now. to adopt. Hello. Well, I, yeah, I just want to, uh, we actually have until 1130, so don't feel like oh. you have to completely rush through okay. this. We've got Well, uh, I'm already sprinting, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to keep <laughs> sprinting here. Um, but the, the time frames by which you have to adopt your maps, um, uh, if your election is June 7th of, of 2022, then as a city, you've got December 15th as your deadline, as a district, it's the 9th. If you're November 8th, then you've got until April or May as a city or a district. Um, so this is coming up here very quickly. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm a little bit terrified for my clients that have to move in December because that's uh, that'll that'll be upon us before we know it. So in terms of the timeline, right? What is going to affect us? Well, if we had the data, it wouldn't be as as uh, as crazy as it is. But COVID-19, of course, has delayed. The data. The Census Bureau has estimated that we should get that by September 30th. Uh, Department of Corrections uh, will then have to look at it and adjust it, uh, as I discussed earlier, uh, based on prison population. We should have the final numbers by Halloween. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do the math. December 31st, December 15th is about a month and a half. Um, so the process has to be put in motion long before um, you get those numbers. If you just start this process on Halloween, you're gonna be in real trouble and not be able to finish in time. Which leads to the next, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't change slides. So next slide. All right, I discussed that slide. Let's go to the next slide. Got ahead of myself here. Okay, so if you do miss the deadline, what happens? Um, well, the law requires um, an immediate petition to the Superior Court to draw the map. If a city does not file that petition within five days, then a resident may file the petition and recover fees. This is a bit of an unknown. Um, just know that if you decide either um, because you don't want to deal with um, redistricting or, or because you just missed the deadlines that you're not going to comply, you likely will be sued and there will be repercussions. So we all have to comply um, with, with this process and it's important that you get started as soon as you can. Okay, next slide. What are the pitfalls? What are the potential challenges? Well, um, first and foremost is just not understanding the hierarchy of criteria. And again, those are uh, different for cities and for special districts, but you have to understand the hierarchy of criteria, not just the criteria, but what is most important, you know, what comes first and what comes fifth, because a court will look at whether you have respected the, the hierarchy of criteria. Um, Stephanie touched on this, um, the danger of using in-house staff versus a demographer. Um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was a norm to go in-house. Because of the changes that we've seen to the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Maps Act, um, it's it's almost become impossible to do that and to comply with the law. Um, maybe uh, the most exposure comes from not complying with Section 2 of the Federal Voting Rights Act. This is the litigation framework. There's a risk analysis um, in Section 2 in federal law. I'm not going to go through that, um, but it basically looks at uh, things like the history of official voting-related discrimination in the subdivision. Uh, 
the extent to which voting in prior elections has been racially polarized. All of these very subjective criteria that a court can look at to determine if the Federal Voting Rights Act has been complied with. This gets very, very complicated very quickly. And if in any way your redistricting process could be contentious, you have to have um, somebody who knows the Voting Rights Act and this litigation framework giving advice. And so you understand kind of how to avoid uh, the, the very real landmines that are put out there by the Voting Rights Act. Okay, next slide, please. Um, you know, all, all of this is is uh, kind of in 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 light of the fact that you you could be sued under the CVRA, under the the FVRA. Um, you you need to have a team in place, a demographer, either your in-house counsel or otherwise, who understands these issues to avoid litigation. There's always the risk of packing and cracking. Uh, Ken Ken went through um, kind of the the pr perspective of, of, um, of a demographer when it comes to drawing district lines, all of the very kind of technical, complicated issues that go into that. And it is very technical and complicated and you have to make sure that you're not either packing or cracking districts. And then finally, anybody who's been through the districting process, right? If you've gotten that letter um, from Shankman or others, you understand what racially polarized voting means. And we have to avoid this at all costs. This, this, this gets to the issues that were discussed in the previous slide uh, when it comes to section two of the Federal Voting Rights Act and that litigation framework. You have to make sure that if there has been racially polarized voting in the past, district, district boundaries are drawn in a way that limits that in the future. Okay, next slide. Um, this is where it gets gets even more nuanced, um, you know, even more potentially complicated. But there is the potential for conflict between the Voting Rights Act and communities of interest, right? And this again gets to racial, to racial and ethnic communities of interest. And you have to be able to look at um, both respecting communities of interest, but not violating the Voting Rights Act while you do that. Um, Finally, we've got SB 443 uh, introduced by Senator Newman. This would apply the Fair Maps Act criteria and the hierarchy of that criteria, along with the FBRA, the CVRA, to all special districts as well as to cities. So um, that 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 could significantly change the lay of the land as well. Okay, so steps to take. Oh, uh, next slide. <clears throat> Steps to take. Uh, right now, you need to retain a demographer. Um, the one thing that I would advise above all else is not to do demography in-house. So retain a demographer, um, talk to your attorney, or retain a legal expert in the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Begin building your website. Stephanie talked about this, right? The requirement to have a website um, that deals with redistricting that has to be up for quite some time, but begin building that now if you haven't already. Uh, decide what your approach is going to be um, with regard to either an advisory, hybrid, or independent commission. And if so, start that formation process and then create your calendar, right? Put all the processes in place, right? All the process that Stephanie talked about, you can do that right now before the census data is released. You can have everything turnkey, right? The the car is purchased. There's 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 gas in the gas tank, the keys in the ignition, so that as soon as you get that data, you can turn the ignition and start going. You can even have all of your hearings, right? As I said here, create your calendar. They can all be scheduled. So all you have to do is get your demographer to start playing with those numbers. And so you have maps in place as that process begins. Again, because of the short time frames that we have due to COVID-19, you're gonna wanna get all of that in place well beforehand. Um, can't emphasize enough um, how complicated this has become in the past few years, um, you know, especially with the emphasis uh, on districting over the past few years uh, because of attorneys like Shankman. Um, the public is watching this and the law has changed. So just be very careful, ensure you have your team in place and um, 
that is it. So next slide, I believe, is our Q&A slide. We are happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, I believe you have our, our, um, our, our contact information. If you have any questions beyond those that, that, that are asked right now, you can always contact us by email. You can make a phone call. We're happy to answer any questions you have. So thank you for your time. Again, happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I will be sharing everybody's contact information at the close of the webinar. So um, you will get that uh, today live. And then um, as a few of you have asked, we will also be distributing the recording and the slide deck after um, the call and so you'll receive it um, that way as well. So um, definitely feel free to follow up with us as needed after the call. Uh, so we do have a few questions already in the queue, but if you have anything else that um, comes up either during this discussion or that you haven't submitted yet, um, again, there's a questions box in your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, feel free to drop any questions in there um, as you think of them. Um, so got a few here already, though. So to kick us off, um, this question is, is about incumbents um, and the redrawing of lines. So do you have to... Uh, consider any any of that in terms of incumbents or could the could the map be redrawn in such a way that it draws the incumbent out of a district does that make sense um, it does make sense actually um you uh actually under the fair maps act you can't consider where your current office holders live right um i mean it can't be a deciding factor in drawing your map now realistically is a council going to draw a map intentionally that's going to get rid of one of their colleagues that's a political decision that's a political you know a political action it's entirely possible that some council might do that um you might have council members that perhaps maybe have moved um, stayed within their district, but moved closer to the lines um, and to where when you do the redistricting, the lines might show that um, a person, uh, you might end up with two council members in one district. One thing that is um, set though, is that nobody's term will come to an end as a result of redistricting. Um, it's just at the, at the end of their current term, if they somehow are out of a district and, and kind of homeless in terms of what district they belong to, um, they, uh, they would not shorten their term. It just, the next time it comes up, they may not be able to run in the same district that they were elected from to begin with. And it bears noting that um, the Fair Maps Act approach to incumbents is different from the approach that anybody who transitioned to districts in the last few years encountered, where you did look at um, at incumbents to a certain extent, right? Um, but now under the Fair Maps Act, we are we are supposed to be blind to that. So yeah, Stephanie, spot on. Great, thank you. Um, there's a clarification about the uh, clarifying question about the uh, deadline as it relates to special districts. Um, so they're trying to confirm if the 11-1 deadline for districts to adjust boundaries um, applies only to districts that are currently already broken up into special districts that are already broken up into districts um, versus those that are going through that process right now. It, it's not November 1. It's 180 days. It's 180 days before they're, they cannot be adjusted beyond 180 days um, before their next election. Now, I, I do want to clarify if, um, and I don't know that we have any on the call. I remember that I saw so many different attendees. Um, school districts are actually March 1st, then that's by education code statute. But any other special district, it's 180 days prior to the election. So um, that's why we're looking at December 9th for a June election and May 11th for a November election. Okay. Um, anything you can speak to about about folks going through the districting process right now? Oh, that um, are transitioning right now. Transitioning right mm -hmm. now. Your de your deadline is um, it's the deadline that's going to be found in the it's what is it the Voters Choice Act that um, you know put the process together for transitioning um, in terms of how many dates in between your how many days between your hearings, but your final date. Your final date is really going to be a date that's going to work for your registrar of voters in getting the maps um, uploaded in time for the election. So you do have to comply with 
you know, completing it within so many, um, within so many days. However, I know um, from personal experience that a lot of times that can even be a negotiation with the person who sought your, your transition. So for example, um, if you received a, a letter from an attorney, um, you know, demanding that it be done. There is a there is a time frame you have to respond in. But if you are actively pursuing re, uh, transitioning and you you work with a work with that attorney and you provide a dialogue with them that says, you know what, we're working towards it. We're going to get it done in time for our next election. Um, this is our date to get it to the registrar. Then typically they're very open with not filing a suit against you as long as you're taking those proactive steps in doing the transition. So. Um, just a good rule of thumb, you might consider um, calling your registrar of voters and asking them what's their drop dead date to get shape files, GIS shape files for your next election. And then that kind of will be your date. You absolutely have to have this process completed. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I'm sure this is a question that you probably have heard a lot, um, but is anybody aware of any discussion of postponement? Um, due to COVID and the delay in the release of the census data. Ken, have you heard anything along those lines? Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I know that there are some other states where like, it depends on who the authority is, that some states are going to the Supreme Court to, uh, to, to get waivers for, for deadlines. have not heard anything out of Sacramento um, in terms of waiving the dates or, uh, you know, changing dates or another executive order or any of that. I have not heard any of that. Got it. Um, so related to that, any, any advice to folks? I mean, we've talked about this a little bit, but obviously these deadlines are very, um, very quickly coming up. So any advice in terms of being proactive and what, what should cities and special districts be doing right now um, to, to be prepared for these, these deadlines? Um, well, I think Mal talked about that almost in his last slide. Um, make sure you have your demographer slash redistricting consultant on board um, to get started and get your calendar identified. You can hold, uh, for cities, you can hold um, two of your four required public hearings prior to, um, you know, it, prior to the release of the data. So, um, you know, you could start having your public hearings in September. Uh, you could have one in September, one in very early October, and then, um, you know, you could have another one, um, you know, it, within, tw you can't have, you can't consider a map for at least 21 days after release of the census data. So whenever that date really is, the very first opportunity for your, um, for your, your legislative body to look at a map from your demographer would be 21 days. So, um, you know, if you have a, a June election next year and your deadline is December 15th or December 9th, if you're a special district, um, I would highly encourage you to start holding your hearings before the release of the data. Now, it's not like um, the transition process where there has to be so many days in between um, your hearings. Uh, you know, they have, you know, 30 days in between hearings and 45 days and all that. It's not like that. You can have them closer together. The only requirement is that um, the maps have to be um, uh, available for review for seven days. Um, however, if the deadline to adopt is closer, there's, there's exceptions for that. And the noticing period goes from seven days to five. And then if it's even closer, it goes down to three or, or it's waived. So depending on your circumstances, I, you, you need to look at the requirements that are in um, uh, elections codes 21,000 at sequitur um, that applies to you, whether you're a charter city, a special, a special district or a, um, a general law city. And it'll tell you what the timeframes, how they condense, or you can call me. We'd be more than happy to help you through that process too. Um, but uh, it uh, highly encourage cities to, to schedule their hearings for the fall before the release of the data because you, you're allowed to do that. Perfect, thank you. Um, this may be a little bit fact specific. So if, if you have any general guidance here, um, that might be helpful. Um, so we've got a question about a, a city that's currently um, at large, so they haven't gone through the districting process through CVRA or anything like that. So they're currently an at-large um, city. Um, 
the question is if they can move to um, a districted be being a districted city without having to establish an elected mayor position. Does that make sense? It might be a little bit fact specific here, and you may need to follow no, up no, offline. No, it's a, but no, it's, yeah, it's no, you absolutely. There are many, 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 many cities that have district based elections that are um, that do not have a directly elected mayor. So they have five council members, they have five districts. Uh, I think that that's actually the norm, uh, as opposed to um, say they have five council members, but it's four districts and one directly elected mayor. Um, I think that's that's not the norm uh, in California. Now, in other parts of the country, it might be, but here in California with the transition, the majority of, of agencies transition to, um, uh, I don't want to say at large, but you know, five districts or seven districts, and then they select the mayor from among them, just like they did when they were all at large. There's actually an argument uh, that is that is uh, often argued by the plaintiffs' attorneys that at large mayors actually violate the California Voting Rights Act. I've actually heard that argued by Shankman. They they argue that um, that. You know that everybody should be by district. So your safest approach, actually, from a litigation perspective, is not to have a mayor who is who is who is at large. Um, now, many cities do that. Um, I have clients who have done that, and they haven't been challenged. But again, the plaintiffs' attorneys do uh, look askance at that. Thank you for that clarification. Um, a couple of questions about about where the data will be. So once um, and if you can remind folks again about the timeline on the, the release of the data too, we've got a couple of questions there, but once that data is released, where could they access it? Can so, you yeah, uh, it, it's like the, the official uh, source is the census website. So census.gov uh, is, is where it will be released. Um, practically speaking, uh, most people are going to be using one of the major uh, commercial mapping programs, um, Maptitude, Autobound, or, or others, um, and they will do the process of taking it from the, the census website and loading it into that mapping software. So it's quite likely that uh, um, you know people won't have to go download the, the data themselves from the census that's available in the mapping software. I do have to say for, for um, um, pro projects that we've done in the past, we have gone and, and downloaded it separately just to make sure that there were no errors as it got loaded into one of the commercial mapping um, products. Um, but that's just a, a double check and we've never found any problem with that. And Ken, isn't it true that they can also get it from the California statewide database once it's, um, once it's finalized? Um, yes, and the statewide database also um, you'll have the appointed building blocks of the uh, the election data matched to uh, um, a census geography and the prison population. Once that's adjusted. A um, couple more process questions. Um, do the adoption of the new maps require just a simple majority of the board or council, or are there different requirements for adoption? If you're a general law city who doesn't have um, a, a charter that has any additional requirements, it's a simple majority of the ordinance. Um, on the the public hearings um, piece, can you speak a little bit more to the noticing requirements? Does it follow the same rules as the Brown Act, for example, or are there longer noticing periods required for public hearings? It's actually shorter. Um, it, it's actually shorter. Uh, under the under the Fair Maps Act, it says um, seven days. You know, uh, you have to notice the map for you know for seven days to notice the hearing. But um, we're adv we're still advising um, people to do a ten day public hearing notice. Um, you know, just from a procedural standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, it's just the time frames for holding your meetings get shorter as we get closer to the deadline. Um, but I, if you know the dates of your hearings, I don't think there's any harm in doing a 10 day public notice for those. Um, it's just how many days you have your maps available depends on how close you are to um, your adoption deadline. Perfect. Um, okay, uh, another kind of 
process e question. Um, so what about folks who, um, for example, are planning to hold a an election in June, but don't have any uh, council members or board members up for election? So if they're if they're holding an election um, for a tax measure or um, something like that, would that require the question essentially about the deadline? So if you don't have folks that are up for re-election or election, um, how does that impact your deadline? It um, it doesn't really. Um, your if they're holding a if they're it needs to be the date of your next general election. Uh, and your general elections are the elections where your um, legislative body members are elected, right? So um, if you're elected in November, but you're going to have a special election for a tax measure or some other initiative or something like that in June, you would use the deadlines for the November election. It needs to be the election that is your general election, um, which is the date where your legislative body members are elected. Okay, perfect. Um, and there's there's still a couple more questions about the data database and the um, the data release. So uh, why don't uh, we will work with this group and get the links for you, and we'll send that out in the follow up um, note so that you guys have um, that at your fingertips in order in terms of where where to go to get that um, data once it is released. Uh, okay. So we do have a few more, but I know we're getting short on time, and so I want to be respectful of everybody who joined us. So um, I apologize if we didn't get to your question. Um, I'll share the contact information here in just a minute, and you can follow up with us as needed offline. Um, but just a quick, couple quick things to flag for you. Um, so this is the first of two webinars that we're going to be doing on redistricting. We're going to dive into um, the community outreach and the community engagement piece a little bit more um, in July. So if you're interested in learning more specifically on that front, um, definitely join us um, on July 20th. Um, we're also uh, have an ongoing series on housing. Um, the next one is is actually tomorrow. We're going to be talking about equity and housing and fair housing issues, but there's a, an ongoing series there um, until uh, October. So if you're interested in that, um, check out our website or sign up for our newsletter and you can get more information there about um, our our upcoming webinars and then just to keep in contact with ILG again if you're looking for more resources from us or more webinars or trainings um, here's our social media handles or definitely sign up for our monthly newsletter um, to get more information about that here's everybody's contact information as promised um, so definitely again don't hesitate to reach out to any of us if you have questions or if anything comes up um, after you get off the line here um, but I do want to give um, our speakers, just another minute here, if they have any closing thoughts or last piece of advice for um, the folks on the line. Anybody have anything to share? I just wanted to say that, you know, I know that there's a lot of concern about can we get this done um, in the amount of time that we have? And as someone who is providing those redistricting services to, um, to various clients, um, I can tell you it's okay. It's going to be okay. Um, even if they're, even if it's a June election, it's going to be okay. Um, we can work out calendars that get it all done and, um, barring some strange, um, event at the federal level where the data doesn't come out, um, when they say it's going to now, um, it's all going to be okay. So take a deep breath and just find the right redistricting consultant, um, to help you through this process and it's going to be fine. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Mal or Ken, any any last minute thoughts for the folks on the line? Yes, I just second what Stephanie said. Uh, don't don't panic. Uh, it, this is hard but doable. Um, and uh, just to say what what a pleasure it's been talking with you all. Perfect. Okay. Well, with that, um, I definitely want to thank all of our panelists this morning um, for sharing their experience and expertise um, on this front. We will be following up, as I mentioned, with the recording, as well as the slide deck for all of you on the line. Um, so keep an eye out for that either later this week or early next week. Um, and then just a big thank you to everybody who joined us this morning um, in the audience. We really appreciate you taking the time to um, to learn a little bit more about the redistricting process. And hopefully um, this eases a little bit of your, your concerns um, to Stephanie's point. Um, and uh, just thank you again. Thank you.